Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar and workshop series conducted by TCS in lieu of the upcoming ACS exams happening in August 2024. My name is Nick and I'm the lead tutor and evaluator for SCS at TCS. So uh, let's look at the session outcomes. Uh, you know, this uh, webinar is dedicated towards uh, 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 conducting a pre scene analysis. So with that, with that in mind, first things first, I'm going to teach you um, what you need to do when it comes to pre scene application. As a senior finance manager, you are involved with long-term decision-making. So you need to be uh, conversant with uh, both the external and internal dynamics of your chosen company, Safewell. And uh, when uh, conducting your evaluations or when um, you know uh, providing your recommendations, you have to make sure that your answers are totally aligned with the internal and external dynamics of your chosen company and uh, that they make financial sense. So you need to be conversant about what appears within your financial statements as well. And whenever you are developing answers, it's best that you bring in relevant information from the pre-scene. So I will teach you how to do it um, in the first part of uh, today's webinar. And in uh, the second and third parts of our uh, webinar, I will be uh, you know, highlighting the industry uh, dynamics uh, concerning the physical and intelligence-led security industry. And uh, then I will take you through the internal dynamics of Safewell, thereby conducting a pre-scene analysis. Okay, so before we get into the nitty gritties, let me quickly remind you about uh, the webinars and workshops which we have scheduled for you. So until your exam on a weekly basis, we are conducting a webinar or workshop free of charge and I hope you'd uh, make use of these uh, free resources which we provide at TCS, especially given the fact that uh, you can easily keep track of your performance on a weekly basis by getting in touch with us via these webinars and workshops. And on top of that, uh, if you encounter any issues after attempting uh, a mock exam, um, or if there's some type of um, a gap in theoretical knowledge, you can uh, you know raise these uh, questions and concerns. I'm always there to help you guys out. So the third webinar, uh, the most important webinar out of the four webinars, Answering Technique is happening uh, next Saturday at um, uh, 10 a.m. UK or 9 GMT. So uh, in this uh, third webinar, I will be teaching you an answering and time management technique. And after teaching you these techniques, I will uh, uh, you know, uh, show you how to implement them in a practical manner by taking you through one of the mocks which we have developed and its suggested answer. So then you'd realize what you need to get right when it comes to uh, uh, planning your answers and when it comes to managing your time, because most students end up failing the SCS exam because they run out of time. So you can avoid all these uh, inefficiencies if you keep practicing these answering and uh, you know time management techniques, which you'd learn next Saturday. So uh, attend it without fail. And on top of that, in the fourth webinar exam prep, I will be taking you through examiner's comments uh, because it's of utmost importance that you understand what's expected from you by listening to the SEMA examiner. And in the same webinar, the fourth webinar exam prep, I will also uh, mention what you need to do to build a positive attitude, um, you know, uh, leading up to your examination. And on top of that, whilst, uh, you know, attempting each mock exam, you, you um, will encounter exam stress so whenever you face exam stress you need to do something to get out of it so uh, i will uh, give you certain tips pertinent to how to manage exam stress and if you keep practicing these uh, techniques over and over again across the five mocks which we have developed at your real exam you will structure your answers appropriately you will never run out of time and at the same time uh, you will get rid of exam stress in a successful manner so that's uh, taught in the fourth webinar. And in the three workshops which we have scheduled for you, I will be taking you through uh, exam standard and pre-scene specific questions covering each uh, syllabus area, E3, F3, and P3, so that you gain an understanding about uh, what type of uh, or how each syllabus area is tested at your exam and what type of uh, answers you are supposed to develop uh, you know, based on the information presented in the pre-scene document as well as uh, the information presented in each and every scenario. And the final workshop, which occurs two or three days before your exam, uh, I will be sharing last minute tips with you to make sure that you walk into your exam with a positive mindset, believing in your skill set. Because if you are positive and if you believe in yourself, chances of you passing the SAS exam is extremely high. 
So I hope uh, you'd uh, get in touch with us on a weekly basis via these free webinars and workshops which we have scheduled for you. All right, so uh, with regards to pre-seen application, what is the right approach? First things first, you need to know your key information. For instance, uh, the fact that Safewell provides physical and intelligence-led security services. Likewise, uh, you know, important information, hordes and hordes of info important information appears within your pre-seen document. So you need to uh, remember these, uh, you know, points, because as a senior finance manager, as I mentioned earlier, you have to be extremely conversant about what happens within your industry as well as what happens within your company. You have to know the numbers which appear within your financial statements as well. So it's not it's not too easy to remember all these points. So in order to make your, um, in order to help you guys out, we have developed three TikTok videos. Uh, you know, and why are these three TikTok videos? We have shared a good mind map. Uh, which consists of uh, the most important points which are highlighted within the pre-seen document. So you need to know your key information as a senior finance manager or to play the role of a, a senior finance manager in a successful manner. And the best way to you know, uh, memorize the most important points is to watch these three TikTok videos uh, which we have developed for you. You can access them via our TikTok handle. And uh, if you keep watching these three TikToks over and over again, until the uh, day of the exam, you need not do anything else to remember what appears within your pre-seen document. And you need to remember the key ratios as well, because as a senior finance manager, whenever you are conducting uh, some type of an evaluation or whenever you are coming up with your recommendations, they need to make financial sense. Um, you cannot forget about the current financial situation of the company when coming up with your recommendations or when conducting your evaluations. For instance, if there's a question about financing options, definitely you have to talk about the current um, gearing ratio and how the gearing ratio will be impacted um, if, if we opt for either uh, debt or equity. And on top of that, you might have to talk about the beta values and uh, um, um, uh, another ratio such as the interest cover should be mentioned within your answers. So that's exactly why you need to know what appears within your financial statements. Again, we have made your life easy because we have uh, developed a set of um, you know slides which uh, you know cover the all the uh, financial statements um, which appear within your uh, pre-seen document. Additionally, we have also covered um, uh, the ratios uh, of your uh, closest competitor as well. So if you go through these set of slides, you will easily understand, uh, you know, about the financial situation of the company and prepare for possible scenarios, but be open minded. So um, uh, we can actually based on the information presented in uh, the pre seen document, we are in a position to predict the type of scenarios which can be thrown at you at your real exam. However, uh, you need to always remember that the information which appears within your pre scene gives us a snapshot of the history of the organization or gives us an indication about what has happened within Safewell in the past. So it gives us an indication about what has happened within the industry and what has happened uh, within uh, Safewell or it highlights the internal dynamics of uh, Safewell and the financial statements provided are pertinent to the previous two years. However, at your real exam, present information will be uh, you know, provided to you as part of the three scenarios uh, which would appear within your paper or the three tasks which would appear within your paper. So um, you can predict about the type of scenarios which can be tested. However, you need to keep an open mind because any syllabus area can be tested and any scenario can be thrown at you. Uh, you know, you need to remember that the examiner is trying to replicate a real life corporate environment. So in a real life corporate environment, if you are playing the role of a senior finance manager, you should have a good understanding about your industry and what happens within your company and uh, what appears within your financial statements. However, you cannot predict the type of issues the company might face or uh, the type of opportunities the company is trying to exploit. So that's exactly why you have to be open-minded because if you're open-minded, then um, you will come up with the best type of solution. So there's absolutely no point of trying to memorize uh, your answers or trying to remember 
uh, the type of scenarios which can be tested at the exam. As a senior finance manager, if you are to be successful, you cannot memorize anything if you are to do your job properly. Instead, you need to, you know, use your analytical skills and develop answers or develop responses whenever you receive an email from your boss. So you need to adhere to the same methodology at this examination as well. And remember that the scenario presented in the exam carries the latest information, as I mentioned earlier. So, you know, when uh, conducting your evaluations or when providing recommendations, you need to consider the information presented in each scenario. And whenever possible, uh, you need to bring relevant information pre uh, information from the preceding document, uh, which is uh, with, with the intention of improving the quality of your answers. You will further understand how to bring in preceding information once you attend the third webinar, because I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to take you through one of the questions which we have uh, included within one of our mock exams. And whilst explaining the answer, I will also explain how relevant preceding information should be brought in when developing your answers. And um, when it comes to referring to preceding information, you are supposed to refer or cite in such a way that it adds value to your answer. So for instance, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if there's a question about uh, the gearing ratio, oh, sorry, uh, financing options, you need to mention about the gearing ratio and the current gearing ratio and how it will be impacted uh, if we opt for debt or equity. And on top of that, you need to also mention about the interest cover, the current interest cover and, uh, you know, whether it's going to increase or decrease and when the interest cover increases or decreases, how it is going to impact our operations. And on top of that, you might have to talk about the beta values. Uh, if there's mention within the question about beta values increasing or decreasing uh, based on the financing option, then you'd have to talk about it. So uh, um, where if there's a question about financing options, other than talking about uh, the gearing ratios or referring to uh, the interest cover and the current beta, if you bring in irrelevant information, if you mention the fact that Safewell is involved with the provision of physical and security, uh, uh, sorry, physical and uh, intelligence-led security services, it adds no value because the question is about uh, financing options. So if the question is about financing options, you need to bring in relevant information from the prison. What is relevant? You have to talk about the current gearing ratio, current beta, as well as... Uh, uh, the uh, the current interest cover, okay? So likewise, whenever you are bringing in information from the precinct and including it within your answer, it should be totally aligned to the requirement and it should be totally aligned with uh, the information which appears within uh, each and every uh, scenario. And uh, when bringing in information from the precinct, show your understanding of the precinct material through relevant answers, that's exactly why I said that whenever you are bringing in info from the precinct, it should be aligned with the requirement and the information which appears within each scenario without making it obvious that you are trying to prove you have studied it. So there's absolutely no point of uh, you know, mentioning irrelevant information within your answers uh, just to prove the point that you have gone through the uh, precinct document. Because mind you, you are supposed to play the role of a senior finance manager working within Safewell. So when responding to your boss, if you mention about an irrelevant point, uh, you know, considering the industry or the internal dynamics of the company, your boss is going to ask you questions about why you included irrelevant information because your role is to assist the decision makers of the company. So whenever you are bringing information from the precinct, it should be done with the intention of further improving your justifications because if you provide appropriate justifications, you will come up with high quality answers, then you will gain the best amount of marks. So in order to understand these things in depth or how to do them in a practical sense, attend the third webinar answering technique, which is happening next week and refer to the suggested answers and the answer plans of the mocks, uh, which we have developed, then you'd understand uh, um, you know, when and how relevant pre scene information should be brought in and included within your answers. And you can uh, again learn these uh, techniques by watching the SCS masterclasses because uh, when developing these masterclasses, uh, our intention is to teach you the logic of each answer at the same time, teach you theory and application skills 
And when teaching you application skills, we cover pre-seen application as well. So by watching these masterclasses, you can easily understand and learn how to uh, get your pre-seen application right. Okay, so uh, how should you tackle uh, uh, the syllabus area? So if you are coming through uh, uh, the SEMA general route, or if you are coming through FLP, and if you have done your uh, previous two case studies, OCS and MCS, at the OCS exam, a higher uh, level of prominence was provided for theoretical concepts. So at the OCS level, you were expected to play the role of a finance officer who is involved with the daily operations of the company. And your role was to assist your finance manager or some other type of manager, middle level manager within your chosen organization. So it's uh, just a matter of 80% of uh, uh, the exam is about uh, replicating theoretical knowledge. But at the MCS level, since you are supposed to play the role of a finance manager, then uh, there's an equal weightage for theory as well as practical application. You need to know your theories. So there are highly theoretical and, uh, you know, questions or, or which uh, there are questions which uh, test your theoretical understanding at the MCS exam. And on top of that, there will be, there are, uh, an equal number of questions uh, which are developed to test your application skills. And at the ACS exam, the examiner is um, predominantly testing your application skills. So the examiner is trying to test whether you have learned something by uh, you know going through the E3, F3, and P3 syllabi. Just because you have learned theory, if you, you know mention theoretical concepts and whatnot, or if you explain theories, you won't get any marks instead Utilizing your theoretical knowledge, you need to develop answers considering information presented in each scenario. So, for instance, um, if uh, the examiner uh, tests your understanding about stakeholder management, there's absolutely no point of you explaining the Mendelo matrix. So, because uh, whenever uh, we are expected to, uh, um, you know, uh, you know, identify our main stakeholders and manage them. We are expected to utilize uh, the Mendelo matrix uh, as per what appears within the E3 syllabus. However, when developing answers, you are not supposed to use the name Mendelo matrix and spend time to explain it. Instead, you need to just say, when trying to manage uh, stakeholders, we have to look at the level of power and interest and then identify the main type of stakeholders. And based on, uh, then you have to argue about uh, each stakeholder's power and interest and based on it, you need to say what we need to do to manage each type of stakeholder. So there's absolutely no point of, uh, you know, mentioning theoretical uh, information or, or mentioning information of the concept, uh, the relevant concept within your answer. So as I mentioned uh, throughout this webinar, uh, 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 the SEMA examiner is trying to replicate a real life corporate environment. You are supposed to play the role of a senior finance manager so it's as if you are responding to your CFO. So if you are actually playing this role, when you receive an email from your CFO, and if your CFO is asking you to come up with uh, stakeholder management strategies, you won't talk about the Mendelo matrix because the CFO is not concerned about theoretical concepts. The CFO wants answers to his or her question. So that's exactly why you need to simply jump in uh, to the task at hand and come up with relevant answers. Again, you will understand how to do these things once you attend uh, our upcoming webinar, a third webinar, which is happening uh, next Saturday. So prepare for application of theories and concepts. Uh, so you need to know your uh, theories and concepts. However, um, you need to really work on your application skills and you need to prepare for interpretation of figures and numbers as well. Uh, so figures and numbers uh, uh, are, uh, provided within your pre-seen document, especially concerning the financial statements. And on top of that, at your exam, as part of uh, reference material, certain facts and figures will be provided. You are not expected to do major calculations at the exam. You might have to rework um, the a fresh gearing ratio or an interest cover or whatnot. Other than that, you need not do any major calculations. As a senior finance manager, all the numbers will be provided to you. Your role is to interpret these facts and figures. So you have to be prepared for interpretation of figures and numbers. And when preparing for your examination, do not skip any topic because any area from uh, uh, either 
the E3, F3 or P3 syllabus can be tested at your examination. I've encountered students uh, who would, uh, you know, forget about certain theoretical elements just because of the, because of the fact that uh, they are not too easy to understand, uh, which is going to be detrimental for you at the exam. Uh, so they do not leave out any syllabus area. Instead, you have to be conversant with the entire syllabus because uh, rather than testing your luck at the exam, it's best that you uh, go through questions uh, uh, or, or prepare your uh, prepare yourself uh, by attempting questions uh, which cover the entire syllabus. You have to be conversant about how each syllabus area, sorry, how each theoretical element is tested at your exam. So with that in mind, you have to attempt the mock exams which we have prepared for you because uh, mind you, when preparing these mock exams, we have made sure to cover the entire syllabus. So for instance, uh, most students leave out, uh, um, you know, uh, business models and business ecosystems when uh, conducting their studies, especially those who are coming through exemption routes. Uh, it's not too easy to understand business models and business ecosystems. So because of that, they leave it out. However, if it's tested at your exam, the weightage will be somewhere around 50 to 60 percent. So if there's a question about business models or business ecosystems, uh, you will end up losing a lot of marks because you are not prepared for it. So rather than, you know, uh, you know, um, planning to lose out marks at your exam, it's best to attempt exam standard and pre scene specific mocks so that you'd know how each syllabus area is tested at your exam. And do not rely on predictions, as I mentioned earlier, because uh, any area can be examined. I've uh, you know heard tutors out there saying that certain theoretical elements will not be tested at your exam and whatnot, uh, which is not true. Any syllabus area which uh, is covered under your E3, F3, or P3 syllabus uh, can be tested at your examination. So it's of utmost importance that you attempt all mock exams uh, to make sure that you cover the entire syllabus and uh, to ensure that you are well prepared for your exam. Okay, so before we move on to the pre-scene analysis, industry analysis, and uh, before we, um, uh, you know, try to understand the internal dynamics of Safewell, let me quickly tell you what we offer at TCS. So I'm on the SCS page. Uh, if you are yet to check our free content, click on this button and uh, create a free user account uh, to gain access to the free content via our student dashboard. Uh, so uh, you will gain access to the recorded versions of the webinars and workshops which we conduct on a, a weekly basis via the uh, free uh, you know, student um, access. And on top of that, you'd gain access to uh, the free mock exam, its suggested answer, as well as its answer plan. And you also have the option of attempting the free mock under exam conditions via our exam platform so that you get a chance to uh, uh, be exposed to exam stress and at the same time, having the possibility of um, uh, practicing answering and time management techniques. So I do not want you guys to go through the mock exam, the free mock exam, or I do not want you guys to go through the answers or try to attempt it right now. Wait until we are done with the third webinar, because in the third webinar, as I mentioned earlier, I will be teaching you answering and time management techniques. So after learning these techniques, Try to you know implement them and see whether you are uh, you know being successful or not. So click on this button and create a, a free user account. And if you are interested in uh, investing on paid content, click on this button and uh, check uh, uh, the sample material to gain an understanding about the type of services we offer at TCS. And if you are yet to uh, join the uh, SES WhatsApp group, click on this button and join it because you can, via this group, you can engage in group learning. And if you have any questions or concerns, you can DM me um, via this WhatsApp group. So uh, make use of these uh, free services which we offer at TCS. Then uh, talking about the packages uh, we offer, uh, first things first, uh, directing your attention towards the value pack. Uh, this is designed for students who had completed their OTQ examinations. So if you had completed your OTQs, you are thorough with your theories. So you need not do anything to uh, you know, improve your theory or, or theoretical knowledge. Instead, you simply need to work on your application skills. So uh, uh, under the value pack, you'd gain access to the recordings of all webinars and workshops, uh, the five mock exams with suggested answers. So uh, in addition to the free mock exam, you will gain access to five more mock exams so all in all, you will gain access to six mock exams 
with the SR history dances. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we have made sure to cover the entire syllabus uh, via these six mock exams. So you need not worry about your performance at your real exam. And you will also gain access to three pre scene analysis videos because your pre scene document is divided into three main elements. In the first part, the, you know, the examiner highlights about industry dynamics. In the second part, the examiner highlights about the internal dynamics of the company. And in the uh, final part of your pre scene document, uh, financial statements of your own company as well as its closest competitor uh, appears. So, you know, focused on these three parts, we have developed three set of videos. So uh, once you watch these three videos, you will gain an in-depth understanding about what appears within your pre-scene document. Then on your own, you have to go through the annotated pre-scene. You will see what an annotated pre-scene looks like in a little while because I will be taking you through the internal dynamics of SafeWell based on the annotated pre-scene which we have developed. And you will also gain access to industry and financial analysis slides. Uh, again, uh, I will be conducting the industry analysis based on the industry analysis slides which we have prepared for you. And uh, you will also gain access to financial analysis slides. So let me quickly show you uh, what our financial analysis slides look like. So um, at the very end of your pre scene document, uh, as financial statements of your own company as well as its closest competitor um, um, uh, appears. So we have evaluated uh, each financial statement in depth, yet we have kept things simple so that you can easily understand uh, the evaluations which we have included within these set of slides. So we have uh, evaluated the SOPL, uh, as well as the statement of uh, financial position and the statement of uh, changes in equity. And then we have conducted a ratio analysis. Again, we have evaluated each ratio in depth to ensure that you gain a good understanding about what happens within your company in a financial sense. Because as a senior finance manager, you need to know your numbers. Without knowing your numbers, if you come up with recommendations or if you try to conduct evaluations, you won't come up with the base type of suggestions or solutions. So, and at the very end, uh, we have uh, evaluated uh, or, or conducted a ratio analysis concerning uh, the closest competitor as well. So that's what our you know financial analysis slides look like. Then you will also gain access to top 20 likely show slides, uh, uh, which indicate the most prominent uh, uh, scenarios which can, which can be thrown at you at your real exam. You will also gain access to a case study familiarization kit by going through this uh, familiarization kit uh, within 15 to 20 minutes, you can gain an in-depth understanding about the technicalities about uh, your SCS exam. And you will also gain access to a tutor managed live chat and OTQ revision cards. So as I mentioned earlier, we have developed the value pack assuming that you already know your theory. Uh, so because of that, um, you simply need to work on your application skills. So after attempting a mock exam, if you feel that uh, you do not remember a certain uh, uh, conceptual framework, or if you feel that you need to brush up your knowledge about a certain theoretical element, simply refer to the OTQ revision cards to quickly brush up your knowledge uh, pertaining to the relevant syllabus area. So, you know, the value pack is priced at 249 pounds. And looking at the premium package, this is designed for students who are coming through uh, the exemption route, as well as those who had failed the SCS exam previously. So both these sets of students have uh, the same problem. They have gaps in theoretical knowledge and uh, uh, they have to significantly improve their application skills. So with that in mind, we have uh, developed additional resources, um, uh, you know, um, when compared to the value pack. So in addition to all these resources you'd gain access to under the value pack, you will also gain access to the online mock exam platform on which you can attempt all six of our mock exams under exam conditions, which gives you uh, um, uh, a chance to practice answering and time management technique and get it right or champion these techniques uh, by the time you are done with all of our mock exams. And at the same time, you have the chance of uh, being exposed to, or you have the opportunity rather of being exposed to exam stress when attempting each of your mock exams. It's best to be exposed to exam stress when conducting your preparations rather than at your real exam. Because if you're exposed to exam stress when attempting each of our mock exams, then you'd know what to do to overcome these type of stressful situations. 
if you practice uh, stress management when conducting your preparations, you will successfully manage stress at your real exam. So it's uh, best that you gain access to the online mock exam platform and attempt all mocks under exam conditions. Then you will also receive one-on-one -on -one tutor feedback uh, on mocks three, four, and five. So you are supposed to get your bearings with your answering and time management technique uh, uh, when attempting uh, the first two mock exams. And from mock three onwards, you will receive in-depth feedback uh, uh, based on your answer script. So as you can see, uh, we have uh, provided um, uh, you know, tutor feedback on a paragraph by paragraph basis. And if there are major shortcomings, we have uh, mentioned them as tutor notes as well. So that's exactly what you can see throughout this answer script, the type of uh, in-depth feedback which we have uh, provided. And at the very end, uh, we have uh, indicated the mark allocations as well. And marks are um, provided on a subtask by subtask basis. And we have also come up with a success rate, uh, which indicates the subtasks in which uh, you need to significantly improve uh, the quality of your answers. So if you look at this uh, student's performance, uh, this individual has only gained 40 marks. That's exactly what you can see. That, that's exactly why you can see that uh, out of uh, all the subtasks, almost all, in almost all, the success rate is below par. So after receiving tutor feedback, Rather than trying to attempt the mock exam in full by you know, allocating three hours of your time, you need to simply focus on redeveloping answer plans, focus on the subtasks which are highlighted in yellow. That's the best type of revision you should be involved with, with the intention of uh, improving the quality of your answers. And once you had um, you know, developed your uh, fresh answer plans, you are expected to compare your fresh answer plans to the answer plans which we have provided to further understand what the shortcomings are and overcome these shortcomings. Because on a weekly basis, if you keep attempting mocks and if you keep redeveloping answer plans, if you keep focusing on uh, getting rid of your issues, then across uh, five weeks, you will continuously improve your performance significantly. If so, you will be extremely successful at your uh, real examination. Okay, so that's the type of feedback we uh, which we provide at TCS under the premium package. And you will also gain access to the answer plans of all six mock exams. Uh, so uh, no other service provider is uh, sharing answer plans. So rather than having access to just suggested answers, we have also made uh, answer plans uh, you know, available under the premium package. So once you have access to this, uh, these uh, answer plans, you are in a position to easily understand how to structure answers. You will easily understand how theoretical concepts have been brought in, how uh, to work on your application skills. And at the same time, you will also learn how to bring in, how and when to bring in relevant information from the pre seen document. So this is the best way to understand the logic behind each answer. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, after receiving tutor feedback, you are supposed to redevelop your answer plans after redeveloping answer plans, simply compare your fresh answer plans with these answer plans to further identify your uh, knowledge gaps and issues with application. And then you can, uh, when conducting your revision on a weekly basis, you can work towards overcoming these issues. All right, so you'd gain access to the answer plans and 15 master classes across the five uh, paid mock exams just like in your real exam, there are three tasks in each mock exam. So three, three tasks into five mocks come up to 15 tasks in total. So focused on each task, we have developed a set of masterclasses. So in each masterclass, uh, we have uh, explained the logic behind each answer. And at the same time, we have taken steps to teach the theoretical concept and uh, highlight how to improve application skills. So if you had failed the uh, SES exam previously, or if you are coming through an exemption route, then you will definitely have uh, issues with application and you'd have uh, knowledge gaps. The best way to learn theory and improve your application skills are by uh, watching these set of masterclasses. Uh, you are within just uh, 30 to 45 minutes, you are in a position to easily uh, uh, learn theory and improve application skills. So if you attempt all five mock exams, and then if you watch these uh, 15 masterclasses, you will learn the entire syllabus and you'd know how to apply each uh, theoretical concept in a practical manner at your examination. 
So once you have access to all this content, uh, you will uh, pass for sure. That's exactly why we are providing a pass guarantee under the premium package. So if you invest on the premium package and if you end up failing, you will gain access to the premium package in your subsequent sitting free of charge. However, in order to claim the pass guarantee, you need to complete these three requirements. You need to complete all uh, five mock exams. If not, you are not in a position to uh, uh, cover the entire syllabus or be conversant with how each syllabus area is tested at your real exam. And when attempting each mock exam, uh, you need to be honest to yourself. There's absolutely no point of going through suggested answers, the answer plans, or the master classes. Instead, try to do it on your own without referring to the answers to see where you stand as a student. Because if you um, understand, only if you understand your shortcomings, you are in a position to overcome your shortcomings. So you have to be honest to yourself and you have to meet the performance criteria for mocks three, four, and five. You need to gain 40% or higher when attempting the last three mocks, uh, given the fact that you are receiving tutor feedback. So we have come up with this criteria to ensure that you are serious when it comes to attempting the last three mock exams. So once you complete all these three requirements, uh, you will definitely pass your SES exam. That's why we are providing a pass guarantee under the premium package. So the price is uh, £849, which can be paid in two installments of £424 each across two months, or you can uh, uh, opt to pay in full and save £100. If so, the price is going to be just £749. And before we move on to the uh, industry and uh, pre scene analysis, uh, let me quickly uh, you know, remind you what you need to do within this week. As per our study plan, we are in week number two. So you have attended the webinar, which is good. Then you are supposed to watch the pre scene analysis videos within this week. Uh, I, I'm talking about three videos, uh, which takes up uh, 30 to 45 minutes per video. So in order to gain an in-depth understanding about the pre scene before you start attempting mocks, you are supposed to watch the pre scene analysis videos uh, within this week, then refer to the annotated pre scene on your own to gain a better understanding or to revise what we have learned via the pre scene analysis videos, then refer to the industry and financial analysis slides. So all in all, as you can uh, see, this week is dedicated towards understanding the pre scene document or gaining an in-depth understanding about what appears within your pre scene. So once you are done with it, from next week onwards, you are expected to start attempting mock exams. So don't start mock attempts right now. Uh, master your pre-scene. After you are done with it, next week onwards, uh, we'll start attempting mocks. And when uh, 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 after you have learned answering and time management techniques, uh, you are supposed to implement, try and implement these techniques uh, when attempting each of our mock exams. Okay, so that's what we offer at TCS. Having said that, let's uh, move on to the pre-scene analysis. So uh, before I take you through the pre-scene document, first things first, I want to uh, highlight about uh, the industry dynamics uh, based on real life industry dynamics concerning your chosen industry. So with that in mind, let's uh, start the session by defining the market. So this time uh, pre-scene is based on um, physical and intelligence-led security services providers. So uh, these companies are not just providing physical security, like you know, securing premises and whatnot. Uh, they are also involved with providing intelligence-led security services, thereby uh, helping the corporate sector handle uh, their data privacy, data security uh, issues, and on top of that, uh, safeguarding um, their information uh, looking into, um, uh, you know, risk management activities and whatnot. So they are not, these uh, players within this industry are not into simply the provision of physical uh, security services. They are also into the provision of intelligence-led security services. So what type of main activities are carried out by these players within this market? Uh, those uh, uh, players are focused on, as I mentioned earlier, physical security and the provision of intelligence-led security services. So under physical security services, they are providing security guarding services. Uh, they are conducting surveillance um, on behalf of clients and they are handling access controls, so various uh, different types of access controls within client premises. 
Then looking at the type of intelligence-led services offered, uh, they conduct risk evaluation, uh, you know, or, or, or focused on a certain company's internal dynamics. And on top of that, based on these uh, risk evaluations, um, these players within the market uh, come up with uh, mitigatory strategies as well. They recommend mitigatory strategies and they provide consultation services and they train um, um, employees of clients who are involved with risk management as well as uh, IT and IES related activities. And what are the goals um, of these companies? To ensure uh, the safety of assets and people. So they are not just safeguarding assets, they are safeguarding people of, uh, or the employees of their clients. And on top of that, they uh, take steps to prevent unauthorized access to uh, client premises and provide timely responses to security incidents. So if there are any security incidents, rather than a certain company trying to handle it on their own, it's best that they seek advice and support from a specialized third party. So that's where companies such as Safewell come into, come into the picture. And they are also involved with uh, risk identification and the provision of risk mitigation services, as I mentioned earlier. So that's how the market is uh, defined. Then let's uh, uh, try to uh, figure out uh, the industry trends. I'm not going to take you through uh, uh, this set of slides uh, in its entirety. Instead, I'm simply going to uh, focus on the most important elements. So looking at uh, the industry trends, uh, there's a lot of technological advancement uh, uh, coming into the picture. So uh, there's uh, uh, the uh, we can see that uh, AI and IoT um, integrations are happening, thereby uh, uh, most major players within this industry are conducting something called smart surveillance activities. So AI can be used to spot uh, issues um, um, uh, or, or security breaches or, or with the intention of preventing them. And on top of that, IoT helps companies connect all different security devices with devices used by uh, employees working within a certain company, uh, thereby creating a good link uh, a good and secure link between these uh, different peripherals and devices to ensure that uh, um, you know security um, is upheld at uh, all times. And uh, these companies are you into using drones for aerial monitoring as well, uh, which is good. Uh, which had uh, made um, um, uh, you know security services uh, efficient. However. You need to be conversant about the risks of using uh, aerial monitoring as well, because uh, if you use drones, you need to comply with uh, uh, the local regulation with regards to the use of airspace. And on top of that, you have to think about how these drones are going to impact uh, the locality. Uh, you have to uh, safeguard the uh, privacy of uh, third parties who are getting affected by these drones. And on top of that, you have to be conversant about uh, uh, you know, aspects such as noise pollution, which occur due to the use of drones. And biometric access controls are, uh, you know, widely used by many players out there. And uh, these companies are also providing integrated security solutions. So integration means uh, combining both physical and intelligence-led security services together. So they are providing um, uh, a combination of physical and cybersecurity services. Uh, especially when coming up with their uh, bespoke services uh, or, or providing um, customized services to their clientele. And uh, uh, the companies are hell-bent on adhering to data privacy uh, regulation and comply with them. So they are always thinking about uh, whether we are falling in line with GDPR uh, uh, when implementing their surveillance activities, especially with regards to the use of drones which are used for aerial monitoring and uh, looking at the emergent trends uh, sorry emerging trends rather um, analytics had advanced significantly uh, because companies are using big data and machine learning for uh, predictive analytics especially given the fact that most companies had invested on ai uh, predictive analytics had become much more accurate so there's a lot of money being pumped in to uh, big data dumps as well as machine learning uh, uh, software. And these uh, players are focusing on sustainability. Uh, they try to provide uh, their services in the most uh, sustainable manner. Uh, and with that in mind, most players out there use uh, solar powered surveillance cameras and whatnot. And 
these companies are also into uh, remote monitoring as well. Most uh, in the good olden days, even if you outsource, uh, you know, security, especially physical security to a third party, uh, this company was supposed to provide their services or this third party was supposed to provide the services within the client's premises. However, things have changed right now uh, due to technological advancements. Uh, so there's uh, remote monitoring happening, uh, which is known as SOCs. So uh, security companies had set up uh, security operation centers, uh, which are remotely located, which helps uh, you know, carry out surveillance activities 24-7, which are staffed with skilled uh, individuals and within a certain SOC, not just one client's security needs are fulfilled, multiple clients' security needs are fulfilled. So this brings down the uh, fixed costs and these benefits are passed down to the end customer via reduced prices, thereby uh, providing value for money. So these are the emerging trends uh, which had impacted uh, your chosen industry. So having uh, you know understood what happens within this industry, you know after I have defined what happens, uh, what this industry is about, I've uh, uh, I, I mentioned um, the trends within uh, this market, and having looked at these elements, let's try to understand what happens within your chosen company, Safewell. So uh, this company is into um, offering physical and intelligence-led security services and they are mostly providing bespoke intelligence-led services. So bespoke, what does it mean? It means that uh, you are providing customized services. So whenever you are uh, providing risk identification and risk mitigation uh, based consultancies, and whenever you are uh, trying to uh, uh, come up with ways and means of uh, ensuring data privacy or security within a certain uh, uh, client's uh, uh, company, or whenever you are suggesting uh, improvements to safeguard data and whatnot, you have to always consider the needs of the client. So that's exactly why when it comes to intelligence-led services, mostly they are into the provision of bespoke services. And they are operating across 74 countries, which is a significant strength because we have a global presence and it's easy for us to drive uh, uh, business given our global presence. So that's exactly why I've mentioned it as a significant strength and our head office is located in the capital city of Berlin, which is our home country. And we have four global regional offices as well. It's not too easy to manage um, uh, operations which occur in 74 different countries via one single head office. That's exactly why we have come up with uh, regional offices as well. This type of uh, decentralization is good for business. And we are employing 460,000 staff worldwide. So. Um, your knowledge pertinent to the way in which we manage our employees, uh, different types of employees uh, will definitely be tested at your exam because we are you know, dealing with uh, a multitude of an extremely high number of uh, staff members. And out of these 460,000 staff members, 22,000 are well-trained risk management consultants. So as I mentioned earlier, we are providing uh, bespoke intelligence-led uh, security services. So in order to provide these type of services, we need well-educated and well-experienced staff members. So that's exactly why we have 22,000 well-trained risk management consultants, uh, consultants, especially given the fact that we are uh, providing consultancy services. Then looking at the history of the company, we were established 104 years ago, uh, which is a significant strength once more, because this can be uti uh, utilized our you know, heritage and our history can be utilized uh, uh, with the intention of generating sales and, uh, you know, uh, maintaining our reputation of uh, uh, as a front runner within this industry. And we were quoted uh, on uh, the Balance Stock Exchange 33 years ago. So we have been uh, listed for, uh, you know, more than three decades which is again good for our reputation. It's easy to drive business when you are a listed company. And on top of that, you have access to equity financing, which is good for us. And uh, we are a major provider of in intelligence-led services for the past 50 plus years. Again, a significant strength of our company. And we are providing consultancy and training in 132 countries in the last 20 years. So we have a significant global presence um, when 
providing both physical and intelligence-led security services, as well as conducting training initiatives. Because when it comes to training, we are operating uh, across 132 countries. And when it comes to providing uh, uh, physical and intelligence-led services, we are uh, operating in 74 countries. And uh, how are we uh, managing our human resources? I said that uh, there's a significant headcount within this company. So uh, we are involved with uh, training our security guards because uh, when securing uh, someone else's premises or when providing um, uh, physical security services, you have to ensure that uh, you know we are uh, recruiting and retaining um, you know uh, skilled staff members not just recruit, we have to work on training them to make sure that uh, they align with uh, the internal dynamics or the internal standards of SafeWell. So that is something good to uh, carry out. And we are uh, focusing on training our employees uh, well, thereby exceeding licensing requirements, which is uh, good, which is good for reputation as well as uh, it's ethically sound. Um, so we can safely assume that uh, since we are trying to exceed uh, uh, licensing requirements, our employees are top-notch when compared to the competitors. And we are providing ongoing training. So we are not just uh, training an individual uh, right after employing him or her. Instead, uh, we keep on uh, continuously and regularly training them to make sure that uh, they are aware of their responsibilities and they are aware of um, what type of skills uh, we demand of them. And we are paying well, we are paying 10% higher than the market, which indicates that we are trying to recruit the best uh, from the industry and not just recruit. We are trying to motivate them by compensating them extremely well. And on top of that, training them on a regular basis. And let's try to uh, understand the type of uh, services offered. As I mentioned earlier, we are involved with the provision of physical security and intelligence-led security services. So under physical security services, we are looking into three main elements. We are managing reception areas. We are providing site security. And we provide security within uh, retail uh, uh, environments, such as uh, in supermarkets and whatnot. So looking at uh, how we handle reception areas, we use experienced staff to operate gates, uh, to manage visitor sign-ins, and check visitor credentials within uh, a client's premises. And with regards to site security, we are using ex-military employees. Uh, why are we using uh, ex-military employees? Because uh, uh, they have to deal with intruders uh, as well as thieves. So in order to manage uh, these type of uh, issues, we need to have uh, uh, appropriately trained and physically, physically fit individuals. So it makes sense uh, for us to recruit ex-military employees. So these uh, site security services include protecting premises, preventing theft, and safeguarding staff members, checking employees and their visitor credentials to ensure that uh, an intruder does not uh, uh, gain access to a certain company's uh, premises, and checking vehicle loads as well as patrolling sites. So all these things are all these services are provided under site security. And when it comes to uh, retail security, usually carried out within retail environments, uh, such as uh, supermarkets, staff is trained to gather evidence and call police after identifying a theft. A major issue within uh, retail environments is theft. For instance, if you look at the supermarket industry, um, you know, 3%, they, they, they allocate 3% of their revenues for theft because uh, usually 3% um, of their revenues uh, um, um, should be allocated for theft or related incidents. So that's uh, loss uh, uh, experienced by most retail outlets out there. So in order to prevent this uh, unnecessary cost, you know, third parties, uh, specialists such as SafeWell provide retail security services. So our staff is trained to gather evidence and call police uh, if they encounter um, uh, an intruder or whatnot, or, 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 or if they encounter threat, a uh, 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 theft rather, and they use uniformed or plain clothes security personnel within these retail environments. And let's try to understand the type of intelligence-led security services provided by SafeWell. Uh, we are 
providing four main uh, types of services. We are providing risk advisory services. We conduct corporate investigations on behalf of our clients. And we also conduct penetration tests and we uh, carry out corporate training initiatives. So what type of risk advisory services are we offering? We are uh, offering risk management services uh, with regards to international expansion. So let's assume a company wants to expand internationally. So when trying to expand internationally, you are exposed to a lot of risks, uh, mainly macro uh, uh, risks. So we have the capability of understanding these uh, macro risks and providing solutions uh, so that um, an international expansion occurs in a smooth manner. So we provide related risk advisory and consultancy services, especially given the fact that we have access to a database of threat profiles covering 97 countries, which is a significant uh, strength uh, possessed by us. So we have evaluated the macro factors. We have an in-depth understanding about the macro factors uh, con concerning 97 countries. And uh, whenever one of our clients wants to uh, expand to a country, we are in a position to easily uh, spot the risks and come up with or recommend mitigatory action. And uh, we are also providing similar risk advisory services for foreign investments, dealings with global suppliers and customers. So when dealing with suppliers, you need to know whether you are, you know, uh, dealing with a reputed uh, supplier, what type of issues you might have to face because due to cultural differences and whatnot, the way in which uh, uh, supplier relationships are carried out differ across countries. So it's best you keep track of all these things. And again, when, when it comes to dealing with international customers, you need to be conversant about um, uh, the culture of the home country. If not, uh, you might face business disruption. So uh, we handle all these elements when providing risk advisory services and when entering into new industries, again, uh, when you are going for some type of an unrelated diversification, it exposes the, uh, you to a plethora of risks. So we have the capability, SafeWell has the capability of, uh, you know, understanding, identifying these risks and managing them appropriately. And when it comes to launching new products, again, the company is uh, exposed to risks we advise uh, these clients how to manage them. And we are also uh, involved with uh, data gathering um, activities uh, via online sources, via social media, as well as via the dark web to give a rounded uh, or, or gain uh, rounded um, information about uh, 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 a certain need possessed by one of our clients. And we are also involved with conducting corporate investigations. So we are conducting bespoke investigations, uh, thereby you know, trying to fix some type of an issue within one of our clients' uh, uh, business. So we are investigating fraud committed by staff members. Uh, we are trying to, uh, we are providing services uh, with the intention of uh, uh, ensuring the accuracy of information provided by uh, you know, uh, business partners of uh, one of our clients, as well as um, we check the accuracy of information submitted by job applica applicants as well. So we are involved with uh, screening uh, the connected, connected stakeholders of our clients. And we also conduct penetration tests on behalf of our clients, uh, thereby checking clients' physical and online security systems to ensure that they are secure, uh, to you know identify whether there are any security vulnerabilities, if there are security vulnerabilities, we will provide uh, uh, recommendations pertaining to mitigate reaction. And we are involved with reviewing controls and documentation issues uh, within our client premises so, or uh, client's business, thereby conducting uh, social, uh, social engineering deceptions or phishing tests uh, to see whether the, the employees are falling in line to the uh, internal controls within uh, a certain company. And we are also providing uh, advice aerial services uh, with the intention of improving uh, the security apparatus within a certain company. And we also conduct uh, corporate training initiatives uh, with the intention of updating technical skills of client managers, especially those who are involved with uh, risk identification and risk mitigatory uh, activities. And on top of that, we try to uh, provide, uh, we try to improve uh, uh, risk management and uh, control skills within a certain client's business, um, yeah, by 
conducting appropriate training initiatives. So all in all, looking at the type of services we offer, both physical security and intelligence-led security services, uh, it appears that we are a front runner uh, within this market. And especially pertinent to intelligence-led security services, we employ 22,000 skilled uh, risk management uh, consultants uh, uh, with the intention of covering all these elements and providing all these different types of services. Okay, so then uh, looking at the revenues and operating profits, uh, we are generating uh, majority of our revenues, 85% to be precise by providing physical security services and just 15% of our total revenue comprises of intelligence-led security services. So we can see that physical security services are our cash cow. However, we have the chance of uh, improving um, the revenues generated by intelligence-led services, especially given the fact that uh, we are providing bespoke services. So whenever you are providing bespoke services, you can uh, achieve higher margins. So that's exactly what you can see when looking at the operating profit figures. Uh, you know, when we are generating just 15% uh, of total revenue by providing intelligence-led security services, when you look at operating profits, we are generating 26% of operating profits by providing intelligence rate uh, security services, which indicate that uh, uh, the margins are high when it comes to the provision of intelligence rate security services. So there's uh, you know room to grow uh, because if we grow our revenues um, in this area, then it will expose us to additional profits in the future. And that's exactly what's uh, highlighted in here. And let's look at the mission, vision, and value system of the company. And I also want to talk about corporate governance and the type of shortcomings uh, uh, within the company with regards to corporate governance. So first things first, let's look at the mission. The mission gives us an indication uh, about the reason for being, or we are trying to uh, address the question, why do we exist? So why is Safewell existing within this market to provide security solutions and services? and to enable clients to focus on their core business. So as I mentioned earlier, we are specialists in the provision of physical and intelligence-led security services. So it's like we um, are a third party providing outsourcing uh, uh, solutions to our clients so that the clients can forget about physical and intelligence-led security and focus on their core business. So that's uh, our mission. That's why we exist. And the vision statement gives us an indication about the future or what we are trying to achieve in the future as a company. We are trying to become the most trusted service provider within this market. So that's a good vision to have because if our clients trust us, then we will keep on generating additional revenues, which leads to additional profitability. And looking at the value system of uh, this uh, organization or looking at uh, the beliefs within this organization, we try to be responsive as much as possible because um, um, uh, with uh, technology advancing, um, the security needs will change uh, continuously. So we have to be responsive as much as possible to the needs of our clients. If so, we are well poised to become the trusted, uh, the most trusted service provider. And on top of that, uh, we strive to be innovative. If we are to be responsive, we have to be innovative at all times and we try to treat our employees properly, thereby focusing on respecting them and ensuring the safety of our employees, especially those who are, who are um, working in high risk areas. So if we treat our employees properly, then uh, they will provide the best type of uh, services uh, when dealing with clients. If that is the case, we are well poised to achieve our vision of becoming the most trusted service provider. So our values are totally aligned with our vision as well as our mission statement. So the overall analysis is uh, at the exam, uh, you will definitely be expected to analyze the stakeholders based on power and interest uh, as per what appears within your E3 syllabus. Uh, we have uh, developed a question covering this element. So you need not worry about uh, how your knowledge is going to be tested at your exam uh, because we are dealing with uh, customers who are spread across 74 uh, countries and we are conducting training initiatives uh, you know spread across 100, 130 odd countries 
And on top of that, when dealing with a certain client and when trying to uh, uh, you know, uh, provide um, uh, security services to them, we will have to deal with the client's connected stakeholders as well. And on top of that, we have to deal with uh, a multitude of suppliers, uh, you know, 460,000 of our own employees. So, you know, it's of utmost importance that you know to spot the most uh, relevant stakeholders and uh, um, that you know how to manage each stakeholder by utilizing a knowledge uh, which you have gained through your E3 syllabus. And uh, as per the value system, employee well-being is considered uh, so your knowledge pertaining to global reporting initiatives or integrated reporting, which is covered under your F3 syllabus, will definitely be tested at your exam. Again, we have covered this element when, within one of our mock exams. So based on all this information, probable exam scenarios which can be thrown at you uh, could be with regards to recommending internal controls in relation to uh, uh, with, with the intention of bringing forth uh, efficiency improvements internal controls uh, to manage stakeholders, um, internal controls uh, with regards to service delivery and ensuring safety at work, and internal controls uh, to manage a certain risk um, which we are exposed to. And uh, let's look at the board members to gain an understanding about the way in which this company is uh, managed. We have uh, a set of skilled, educated, and experienced individuals as our uh, uh, board members, which is good for our company. And all these individuals possess appropriate industry knowledge, again, which is good for us because uh, our board members should have a good understanding about the internal dynamics of the company, as well as its external dynamics. As board members, you need to have something called an outside-in approach. So an outside-in approach uh, means that uh, since you are involved with long-term decision-making, since your decisions are going to impact the long run of the company, you have to first think about how the industry is going to react to your decisions. You have to think about your main stakeholders, such as your suppliers, your main customers, as well as how the competitors are going to react, the, how the government or a regulator is going to react to the decisions which you arrive at. And after you think about the industry, then you need to think about the internal dynamics of your chosen company as a board member. So it's good to have uh, skilled and educated uh, individuals. Uh, 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 and uh, it's good to uh, know that these uh, individuals possess appropriate industry knowledge and they uh, have experience within SafeWell as well because uh, all board members have worked within SafeWell for a certain period of time. And uh, although all these uh, positives are there, uh, there is an imbalance between executive directors and independent executive directors, uh, sorry, independent non-executive directors rather. So we have just five executive directors and four independent non-executive directors, which exposes us to governance risk, So, which is covered under your P3 syllabus. So as per uh, corporate governance regulation, it's best practice to have a good balance between executive directors and non-executive directors. So the executive directors are involved with the daily running of the company. The non-executive directors are within a board representing stake, uh, shareholder interests. So um, um, it's good to have a good balance between executive directors and non-executive directors uh, to make sure that the company is managed with shareholder interests in mind. So there's, a, uh, there's an issue pertaining to this element. It's best that we... Uh, appoint an additional independent non-executive director to get rid of uh, our uh, governance risk exposure. And some board members have held uh, academic posts, which is good for us uh, because uh, when it comes to providing consultancy services, uh, when we have uh, academics on board, they are in a position to you know, uh, uh, design uh, uh, training sessions as well as consultancy sessions uh, because they understand how to you know, educate someone or how to conduct training initiatives. And this is good for recruitments as well, because uh, uh, based on um, uh, the recommendations of board members, we can recruit appropriately skilled and educated individuals from universities in which uh, these individuals uh, were teaching. So all these things are positive. I've highlighted uh, a negative element as well. And uh, looking at the board composition, 
it's better to appoint an executive director or non-executive director with IT or IS expertise. So we are involved with the provision of physical and intelligence-led security services. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a lot of technology being used within the industry and we are using a lot of technology as well. And on top of that, uh, especially when it comes to uh, uh, providing uh, intelligence-led security services, uh, we are supposed to conduct penetration tests. Uh, we are supposed to, uh, you know, provide recommendations uh, to, to identify issues within the, our client systems um, and uh, provide recommendations to overcome these issues and whatnot. So if we are looking into these elements, if you are dealing with technology as well as different types of systems used by our uh, uh, clients, then it's of utmost importance that we have a leader within the board um, who has uh, IT or uh, IS expertise. So they, that's a major shortcoming. If you look at uh, all these directors, we do not have someone uh, uh, who is handling or spearheading IT or IS. So it's uh, at your exam, uh, you might have to recommend the appointment of a CTO, chief technology officer, or a CIO, chief uh, information officer, or simply an IT director. Uh, it could be an executive role or a non-executive role based on the information presented in each scenario. You need to build your arguments. Uh, we have covered these elements within our mock exams and looking at all the other board members and, uh, and their responsibilities, we can see that board responsibilities are properly allocated. And based on all this information, the probable exam scenarios which can be tested will be with regards to appointing an executive director or a non-executive director especially given the fact that uh, there's uh, a lack of leadership with regards to IT or IES. There could be a question uh, in your exam uh, where the board is contemplating about appointing um, an IT or IES director. And when doing so, uh, you will be supposed to uh, evaluate whether the company should appoint an executive director for the role or a non-executive director for the role. So we have uh, you know, developed a similar question and included it within one of our mock exams. So you need not worry uh, about how to tackle this type of a question. And um, definitely your knowledge pertaining to board responsibilities will be tested at the exam and uh, board composition versus corporate governance. Uh, uh, you will have to um, you know, build your arguments concerning corporate governance and the way in which uh, um, our board is uh, designed. And uh, I, before, um, we wind up, I want to quickly take you through the board committees as well. There are four committees, uh, thereby falling in line with uh, corporate governance regulation. We have an audit committee, a risk committee, a remuneration committee, and a nomination committee. I'm not going to talk about um, the uh, responsibilities of each committee because I've covered them in depth within uh, the pre-scene analysis videos uh, uh, which we have developed for you. So. The non-executive chair, uh, uh, an issue with the composition of these board committees, the non-executive chair, as you can see, sits in the uh, audit committee, which exposes us to governance risk as per corporate governance guidelines. The non-executive chair is not supposed to sit in the audit committee. So at your exam, whenever there's a question about corporate governance, uh, it's best that you uh, mention this fact. And uh, when you look at all these committees, uh, Independent non-executive directors dominate all uh, committees, thereby uh, you know, falling in line with corporate governance best practices. Again, I've uh, explained these uh, elements in depth uh, in the uh, pre scene analysis videos. And the, as per the information presented, the, the chief internal auditor reports to the convener of the uh, audit committee, again, aligning with corporate governance best practices. So. Uh, based on all this information, your knowledge pertaining to the combined co code of corporate governance uh, in the UK, which is highlighted within your E3 syllabus, will definitely be tested at your exam. And again, we have uh, developed question uh, questions covering these elements. And I want to quickly uh, focus your attention towards the principal risks report. Uh, so uh, at your exam, you are expected to uh, identify risks and uh, come up with uh, mitigatory action. So when doing this, you need to think about the existing controls within the company and uh, evaluate whether the existing controls are sound or not, okay? If you feel that the existing controls are not too good, then when developing your answers, 
you need to mention uh, the type of action we are supposed to take to improve uh, uh, the risk management initiatives practiced within SafeWell. So let me quickly, I've, I've you know, evaluated each of these risks in depth within the precin, uh, annotated precinct itself. I just want to direct your attention towards the fourth risk, contractual risk. So as per what appears within our uh, principal risks report, um, we are exposed to a risk uh, due to complex long-term contracts, especially in foreign currencies, which can be uh, onerous. So that's the risk. We, so that's the risk which we have identified. And what type of mitigation action have we uh, come up with? We have, uh, we have, uh, we, we are trying to conduct detailed reviews of contracts by legal staff and regularly review ongoing contracts to manage adverse issues. So we have identified the risk, uh, which is tied with uh, complex long-term co contracts. When dealing with clients, we have to sign long-term long -term contracts and uh, these clients uh, are spread across the world. So because of that, we are exposed to forex exposure, forex risk exposure rather. And what type of mitigator, mit mitigatory action have we come up with? We are carrying out detailed reviews of contracts, uh, including our legal staff members. And uh, we uh, not just uh, review them once, we try to regularly review them. So we have, although we have identified two main risks, we have only come up with uh, mitigatory action focused on one single risk. That too is not uh, foolproof. So we have forgotten about our forex risk exposure when coming up with mitigate reaction. So based on this information, I've conducted an assessment. The mitigation measures are appropriate, but uh, SafeWell could benefit from implementing a contract management system. So we are dealing with hordes of customers out there spread across the world. So just you know, conducting reviews involving our legal staff is not going to be too easy especially given the fact that we are dealing with a lot of clients spread across the world. So we cannot bombard our legal staff with, uh, you know, hordes and hordes of uh, contracts. Instead, we have to, you know, come up with a better uh, uh, way or mean of managing this risk, contractual risk. So how are you supposed to manage contractual risk in a foolproof manner? It's best to come up with a contract management system. So this is not highlighted within your pre-scene. Instead, when developing your answers, you can say if there's a question about contract risk and um, you know when conducting your evaluation, you can say or state the fact that the current you know system works in this way, but I'm suggesting that in order to further improve the quality of uh, the risk mitigatory uh, 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 strategies uh, uh, adopted by the company, it's best that we opt for a contract management system why am I suggesting that we should implement a contract management system? Because if we implement it, we are in a position to streamline the review process and enhance uh, risk assessment and risk management. And on top of that, as I mentioned earlier, SafeWell has failed to identify the exposure to forex risk. And what type of enhancements am I suggesting? So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we should uh, invest on uh, a contract management software, if we implement this contract management software, we are in a position to uh, keep track of uh, 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 contractual discrepancies on a real-time basis, and we can, uh, you know, uh, measure the performance of each and every contract uh, to see whether we are adhering to the timelines and whatnot. Whether to see whether uh, our customers are paying us on time and whatnot, we can automate all these things. And when, whenever, uh, when it comes to uh, contract renewals, we can automate the entire system and we can uh, conduct risk assessment initiatives in a centralized manner via this contract management software. And not just uh, a contract management software will help us, we have to implement a centralized repository for all contracts, which can improve accessibility and transparency. So we are dealing with you know, clients spread across the world so rather than uh, you know trying to manage uh, contract risk via our head office and the four regional offices, it's better to come up with a centralized repository so that we know that all contracts are managed in a uh, uniform manner. 
and we are trying to uh, you know uh, get rid of contractual risks in uh, in an uniform manner via this centralized system which i am suggesting and additionally it's best to uh, conduct regular training for staff involved with uh, uh, contract uh, negotiation to make sure that when we sign the contract uh, there aren't any hiccups which will help us prevent uh, our exposure uh, towards contractual risk and um, also to ensure that they are equipped to handle complex contractual issues in an effective manner and there's no mention about the exposure to forex risk so with that in mind uh, it's best that we go for uh, hedging instruments uh, utilize hedging instruments such as forward contracts futures and options uh, and likewise and definitely this will be tested at your exam because uh, um, managing forex risk uh, appears within your p3 as well as f3 syllabi also the company uh, can include currency clauses in contracts uh, to address uh, exchange rate fluctuations thereby fixing exchange rates or uh, we can um, you know spread uh, currency exposure across multiple currencies um, when you know signing these uh, uh, contracts as well so you know again these uh, elements these enhancements we have uh, you know developed questions to test your understanding about uh, contractual risks as well as the various different risks uh, highlighted within your principal risks report we have covered all these risks and for each of these risks we have uh, uh, developed um, appropriate and sound mitigatory uh, uh, strategies uh, you can gain an understanding about these things by uh, referring to our pricing document as well as uh, by uh, referring to the suggested answers the answer plans and the master class master classes which we have developed for you okay so um that's what i wanted to uh, you know uh, tackle under the pre scene analysis. I hope you gained an in-depth understanding about what happens within this chosen industry and uh, what happens within your chosen company, what type of strengths it um, you know, uh, enjoys, as well as what type of shortcomings there are. And uh, based on these shortcomings, uh, you know, your uh, exam questions or, or, or exam scenarios will be tested at your real exam. You will understand how to, you know, uh, bring in theoretical knowledge as well as how to work on your application when developing answers in your upcoming webinar, which is happening on next Saturday. So um, having said that, uh, we are thrilled to say that we achieved a 94% pass rate uh, in the February sitting. Um, and if you, you know, um, stick to the study plan, you are simply supposed to allocate seven hours of study time per week. So if you stick to the study plan, and if you keep attempting a mock exam per week, uh, closer to the exam, you will be relaxing when all the other students are scrambling for time. So uh, by sticking to the exam, you can uh, achieve a sure pass at your ACS exam. So having said that, uh, I'm opening up for a Q&A. Definitely you will have questions about the internal dynamics as well as the industrial dynamics of a chosen company. Uh, so it's uh, you can raise your concerns right now. I'm going to pause the recording.